This episode is brought to you by Harmony. Please stay tuned for more information about them later in the episode. What's up, everybody? I'm Scott Melker, and this is the Wolf of All Streets podcast, where twice a week I talk to your favorite personality from the worlds of Bitcoin, finance, trading, art, music, sports, and politics, basically anyone with a good story to tell. Now, in the crypto world, we often use the statement, unbank yourself, to describe the endless possibilities that the sector has to offer for people who are sick of legacy systems or lack access to them in the first place. Today's guest is actually making that catchphrase a reality. Alex Mashinsky's company, Celsius, is providing many of the services that legacy banks are completely lacking, like interest and yield, zero fees, fair loans, and lightning quick transactions. By having Alex on today, I hope to better understand how his business is competing with legacy banks and what he thinks the future of finance looks like. Alex Mashinsky, thanks so much for coming on the show for a second time. Yes, Scott, thanks for having me back. uh, And uh, thank you for all the work you're doing, educating the community and and people who are new to the space. So love love your work. Thank you, man. I really appreciate that. So listen, as I touched on, you were here before. Last time was in October, so nine months ago. Can you, I guess, first just uh, give us a quick quick brief intro to what Celsius is for those who might not know, and then uh, get us up to speed on what's changed for Celsius in the last nine months? Sure, yeah. Uh, so we do two very simple things. We, we earn yield on 42 different assets. So we pay you interest on uh, Bitcoin, Ethereum, uh, Litecoin, whatever your favorite asset is. And we've been doing that longer than anyone else uh, since 2018, basically. And uh, you can earn, uh, uh, for example, 8.8% on your stable coins, 6.2% on your Bitcoin. Uh, without having to do anything. You don't have to farm. You don't have to move stuff around. Every Monday you get interest payment and uh, you can withdraw at any time. There's no lockups. Uh, also, we provide margin loans. So instead of selling your Bitcoin, paying taxes, you can basically borrow dollars against your Bitcoin. We charge 1%. That's the lowest fee uh, that anyone in the industry charges. And uh, you can use those dollars to pay off your credit cards, uh, you know, pay your mortgage and everything else. So those are the two key services. We do other things, but those are kind of cover most of the stuff that our customers, we have almost a million customers, 17 billion in assets. So uh, definitely uh, a much bigger numbers than the last time I was on the show. Well, it's been quite a run <laughs> yes. since last October, which, which uh, you foresaw. At the time, you know, you were looking for that to happen. So, you know, anyone who wants to play it back, I think we'll find that uh, you were very much expecting a serious bull run and even that you were expecting a correction afterwards, correct? Yeah, so I, I hit the uh, right, right on the button calling 30,000 for Bitcoin at the end of the year. And this year I'm uh, calling uh, again a, a peak of about 140 to 160,000. Mm-hmm. But I expect us to close the year. We're going to have a big spike and we may close the year a little bit below 100,000. So uh, so there's a second coming. Right now, there's a little sideway movement, but uh, there's definitely going to be another run up uh, in prices for Bitcoin and Ethereum. And what makes you think that that's so likely to happen fundamentally? So, yeah, so we, we, we're basically the, the Celsius community is the hodler community. And most of us uh, on the news cycle talk about the traders. We talk about the, the 10%, the, the tail that wags the dog and not the 90%, which is the mass. So when I look at the behavior of my community, I see us like last week, we've added uh, $300 million in net deposits, uh, which is one of our best weeks ever. And that tells me that my community, which is almost a million people, uh, uh, is uh, going to push prices higher uh, faster. So uh, yes, we are uh, reducing leverage in the system. Yes, we are getting rid of all the tourists, uh, but the hardcore guys, the guys that are just accumulating Bitcoin, they're letting it earn interest, are buying more faster than ever before. So uh, we're also predicting that there's going to be a flippening, meaning that Ethereum is going to have a higher market cap than Bitcoin. Why? It already happened on the Celsius network. So I think we are a leading indicator and uh, I'm not a, a magician or, a, a, or a, what do you call it, a fortune teller. I'm just telling you what the community is already doing. 
I was looking for a crystal ball behind you somewhere in your uh, beautiful apartment, but I couldn't find one. And on-chain metrics actually are supporting what you're saying. From what I've seen, it really has flipped when you look at the size of wallets and the active wallets that really the speculative ones who have been holding for a short period of time are selling, while the large wallets that have uh, been around for a long time and have huge balances are buying and are not selling. And that's a clear indication in any market that weak hands are selling into strong hands, right? Yeah, and, and the events that brought Bitcoin down, like the crackdown in China, the miners moving, uh, all this FUD, uh, you know, the Fed, this, that, all that are, are they're all one-time events. So I think uh, as we flush through that, we're going to see ra rapid acceleration to new highs. And, and we haven't, on Bitcoin, we haven't had that uh, blow of top that we've had in every other uh, market mm -hmm. uh, top in Bitcoin history. So. I don't think this cycle is different uh, and the side movement is just an accumulation and we'll see new all-time highs. Something that I have noticed that's different at this point in the cycle is the rates being offered by various uh, uh, yourself and your various competitors. Um, notably, it's been somewhat of a drop across the board I've seen. Obviously, some like yourself have maintained or even raised their rates. Um, but it's made a lot of people, I think, scratch their heads to see interest rates or yield rates dropping so, so much as the market has turned. Can you explain why that's happening and how you've been able to avoid that? Sure, that's a very good point. So, um, so when Celsius created yield two years before DeFi, first everybody told us, uh, you guys are crazy, this must be a hat trick or it's, or it's a scam or it's some kind of a Ponzi scheme. And now we have over a hundred competitors, right? But uh, most of these competitors only do one thing. They just do GBTC arbitrage. So they just do DeFi on Ethereum. And what Celsius has managed to do is have five different sources of yield, right? We are one of the largest uh, lenders to institutions. So that's still the majority of our business. We lend to exchanges. So all these coins coming off exchanges, coming to Celsius, then in, uh, the exchanges call us and say, can I borrow coins from you? So the coins they used to have for free, they now have to pay to provide liquidity, to provide uh, cash flow, provide leverage and so on, so on. Then we have uh, margin lending. We talked about that. Our customers are borrowing uh, dollars. So that's uh, a source of yield for us. We are one of the largest participants in DeFi on multiple chains. Uh, uh, but we both we play on DeFi on both sides. When the rates are low, like right now, we are a borrower. When the rates are high, we are a lender. Uh, and most of these, uh, most of our competitors only do one of the two. And the fifth uh, leg of the stool is mining. We invested over two hundred million dollars in mining. We're one of the largest miners in North America, uh, which effectively is yield on Bitcoin. Right? When I get, I have a Bitcoin factory that prints new Bitcoin every ten minutes and I get to pay most of it to my community uh, as part of the yield that they're earning on the assets they contributed. So, uh, so again, nobody has been able to replicate that. And uh, if somebody is just in DeFi and they're earning two to 3%, uh, because that's what the market is in DeFi is right now, they cannot pay the 8.8% .8 that Celsius pays on stable coins. So you're, you're effectively more diversified in theory than the competitors, which allows you when one spigot shuts off to sort of uh, turn on another one. Um, and you talked about the GBTC trade. Was that what was driving most yield for most companies when there was that huge premium? Yeah, so I think BlockFi was a one trick pony. Uh, uh, and as long as there was a premium there, most of it was last year. Uh, they kept running uh, uh, with that. Uh, I think they were still still subsidizing it from their venture capital money and f subsidizing yield. But this year, the like the discount right now on GBTC is 15%. It's minus 15%. Add to it a 2% year, yearly fee on from Grayscale and the 4 or 5% you have to pay the customer and you're now at 22%. That's your cost of maintaining that yield trying to compete with Celsius. So we're at plus 6.2, they're at minus 22%, right? That's pretty painful. So most of the people who played that just said, I'm out of the game. You know, it's like uh, you fold your cards and you walk off the table. And, and uh, that's part, also part of the reason why we've seen record deposits. A lot of uh, coins are coming from all the other guys who just can't keep it up. 
and our community loves it, right? We, I'm the largest user of Celsius. I have over $300 million of my own money. I get to pay, I get, I, I get to pay myself more. So there's no, there's no some trick here or whatever. Yes, as a shareholder, I earn less, but as a depositor or a user of the platform, I earn more, which is good for everybody else who's on the bus with me. It's really so interesting to hear. That means the presumption for people offering those rates, and I'm not uh, singling anyone out, is that those opportunities would last forever, right? And it's kind of strange because we all know that this is an inefficient market, right? It's sort of like thinking about hedge funds in the 80s where they would find all these opportunities to arbitrage and, and make money, but they never last forever. Right. I mean, any any major inefficiency is always arbitraged out and eventually goes back to zero. So what's the long term expectation if a company is only using one or two of these inefficiencies to try to offer yield? Didn't they know that it would come to an end? So, like I said before, we originated this whole category and then we continue to innovate while other people just try to copy one or two of our ideas. Right. So. So yes, we have GBTC as well, but it's a low single digit of our assets, right? Where uh, I think BlockFi, if you look at their uh, filings, right? Because they, they were over 5% of GBTC, they had to file uh, uh, with the SEC and they reported, I think 7% of all yeah, seven the holdings, seven or eight percent yeah. of 30 something billion dollars, right? So that was the vast majority of their assets in one strategy. So uh, Celsius has hundreds of strategies, hundreds of strategies. And what we offer, the rate we publish is the blend of all of those things, all the strategies for Bitcoin, all the strategies for Ethereum result in a 6.2% rate or 5.75% rate on, on Ethereum or whatever. So, so or 8.8% on stablecoin, which is crazy. Again, almost a hundred times more than your bank pays you. Uh, so, and, and we do that without uh, taking any risk we, or taking minimal risk, right? We had zero counterparty liquidations, both us having to liquidate a, one of our institutions or somebody having to liquidate Celsius because we didn't provide enough collateral. So I don't think there's any other company uh, in crypto that's doing what Celsius does that can come on your show and say, we had zero liquidations or we did not liquidate any of our customers. Right. So, D yeah. But yeah, does so that, there, that just does, tells you please. Bitcoin just went through a 53% drawdown, right? Zero liquidations. Uh, show me a bank anywhere in the world that can go through a 50% liquidation and survive 50% uh, uh, liquidation in the stock market or the bond market or the commodities markets, right? The Fed is going to jump in and have to bail them five times over uh, before that happens. You said, show me who can survive. And I was going to say, everybody. Because there's an artificial floor, no matter what happens, right, somebody's going right. to bail you out, right? And I, I've pointed out a number of times that that's what's so unique about Bitcoin and so incredible and what makes this such a clearly a free market is that nobody had to step in to save Bitcoin when it dropped over 50% in a matter of weeks. Nobody had to step in to save the miners when half the hash rate went offline at once. The network continues on, the market continues flowing without a right, centralized but, but party. You're 100% right, and, and it's important to understand that it comes at a cost because most people don't understand that this printing of $7 trillion is to be able to put a safety net under the entire US economy and bail out the financial institution and the banks and the good companies and the bad companies and so on. So all of us are paying for it. It's not for free. All of us yeah. are paying because the government on one side takes 50% of our money through taxes and then comes the Fed and debases the currency and steals another 20, 30, 40% of our money. Just in the last 12 months, they printed 40% of all the dollars ever. So you had a 40% inflation. You lost a third of your money like this in one year. You just don't know it. You don't feel it yet. So, so I think uh, uh, crypto proving that it can run on its own, proving that it does not need a bailout, does not need a handout, will force many, many people to migrate from the fiat world to the crypto world, because they're going to understand that okay, my my assets are safer in a limited supply, completely independent infrastructure than on one that depends on the Fed or depends on the Treasury or or somebody bailing me out. Because you can bail out as long as the dollar still has its power, but the minute the dollar loses its power, you can print all the money you want. It's not going to help you. 
Do you think that will happen? It's definitely going to happen because every uh, empire in history, right? The Roman Empire, the Byzantine Empire, you name an empire, I'll show you that they collapsed very, very quickly after they debased their currency, right? Uh, uh, the, 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 I can give you many, many examples. There are 700 fiat currencies, actually, that all are worth zero in history, right? And all of them, there's, an, uh, there's in one example of a fiat currency that maintained its value. So the experiment we're running here has been proven 700 times. The, right. the Fed has to prove to us that they can pull a rabbit out of a head and not end up just like the, the previous 700 fiat currencies. Ironic, because we talk about a black swan event, like the collapse of a currency would be the black swan event. But in this case, the black swan event would be if the currency doesn't collapse. Right. <laughs> right? I mean, so it, in context. And, we, and we, are, we are already inside the event horizon, inside the black hole, uh, because we can't, you, the Fed cannot stop printing money, it cannot stop buying the debt, it cannot stop supporting the markets, it cannot basically withdraw. And, and you're seeing, uh, like, uh, I don't know if you saw, but there, there's a thing called reverse repo, where this is where <laughs> banks basically take all the cash they have and they say, I don't want cash, it's too risky. I want to give it back to the Fed, right? Uh, which is the opposite of what the Fed wants. The Fed is throwing money at the banks and say, give it to everybody, go issue loans, give it to the broker dealers, right? Do anything you can to create GDP in the economy, to create the acceleration in the economic activity. And here are banks are taking a trillion dollars, right? Huge amount of money and just throwing it back and saying, no, I don't want it. So, so, uh, uh, so there's definitely tremendous uh, 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 market uh, fluctuations, market power that's going on that is happening under uh, the surface that people just don't see, they don't know about it. And the consequences of that are not yet known. So, so this is a giant experiment that has never been tried before. A, a version of it worked in Japan for the last 30 years, but, but Japan is not the reserve currency of the world. Right. And, and we have to see what happens to the United States uh, when it floods the world economy with uh, tens of trillions of dollars and thinks that there's not going to be any consequences. Yeah, recently there was a, one night was an 800, roughly $800 billion reverse repo in one night, which effectively erased six months of quantitative easing in, in one night. Of course, it goes back in, but it really is astounding when you dig into what's happening after hours when nobody's watching. It's, yeah, and the repo market, look, the re what started this whole thing, everybody thinks it's Corona. But if you actually go and dig into the numbers, the repo market froze in September of 2019. That was a few months before Corona. And the Fed had to inject over $600 billion in a few days, right? And then commit to provide a trillion dollars of liquidity at all times because banks just did not trust each other. So we already have cracks in the system. We already have mistrust, distrust, because institutions don't know who is solvent and who's not solvent. And at the same time, the Fed chairman goes yesterday in a hearing and says, Bitcoin has proved itself as uh, something, as, as not a form of payment. So yeah. I tweeted this morning, I said, that's right. And uh, uh, the dollar has proved its, itself as a horrible store of value. Guys, I'm really excited to be sponsored by Harmony. I know all of us have traded their coin one in the past, but what they're fundamentally doing is a game changer. Harmony is your open platform for assets, collectibles, identity, and governance. Think of it as the one to bridge all blockchains. Harmony is open and insanely fast with two second transaction finality and a hundred times lower fees than Ethereum. Their secure bridges offer cross-chain asset transfers with Ethereum, Binance, and almost every single other chain. Maybe most exciting is that Harmony, in cooperation with Sushi, will be providing $4 million in incentives for liquidity mining. Find out more about this program and build something yourself at thewolfofallstreets.link slash Harmony. That's thewolfofallstreets.link slash Harmony. Build on Harmony, run on all chains. To me, the story wasn't what the Fed chairman said. It's that the Fed chairman had to talk about crypto. That's right. Did you ever, even a year ago, I would have in a million years not thought that we would hear Jerome Powell having to cautiously tiptoe around crypto and talk about it over and over and over again in a meeting. 
That's right. So, so uh, you know, calling the cow black uh, is definitely tells you that there is a problem. And uh, again, look, I'm a proud American. I'm sure you are as well. And and we are not saying any of these things, kind of trying to push the dollar off a cliff and and make it disappear. Yeah. We we're trying to save the system, and we're ringing the bell and saying, look, uh, we're about to make the worst mistake in the United States history by debasing by taking this golden goose called the us dollar right and thinking that you can just keep plucking feathers out of it and thinking that the goose will keep flying no it will not fly it would crash and it will stop laying golden eggs okay this is a very bad experiment so let's stop it let's protect the goose let's let's stop printing money and if companies have to go out of business that is the cycle that is the economic cycle that the united states does better than anyone on the planet we know how to recycle all these companies and all these employees and all this infrastructure better faster than anyone else that's what created america now we look like a socialist or communist country where we are telling we're basically saving the entire economy putting a safety net under the worst companies the zombie companies who's going to benefit from that Right, not the guy who's who's got hurt from COVID and lost his job, right? So, so we're enriching the rich, and and like you said, instead of unbanking the banked and banking the unbanked, we are enriching the people who are already rich, who have access, who are close to the pool, to the to the plate, the political plate, close to the financial plate, and this uh, Cantillian effect is just going to destroy this country. Can the Fed stop now, though? Uh, some would argue that 2008 was the chance, right? You could have said, OK, the banks fail. There's going to be a lot of pain. But maybe in 2021, we're in better shape in that scenario than we are in 2021 after the other scenario. Hard to know, right? Because hindsight is uh, 2020. We don't know what would have happened. But is it too late for the Fed to stop printing? I mean, some would argue that at this point, there's just no option. Well, this is the fourth Fed chair who's doing the same thing. He, Jerome Powell uh, inherited the problem. It's not like he created the problem, right? right? I mean, uh, and every bailout, you just have to add another zero because every bailout since the 90s is 10 times bigger in dollar terms than the previous one, right? So, so the problem you have is, is that the Fed is high on its own supply and, and it has to take the medicine and it just doesn't want to take the medicine, right? So, and we as American, we prefer to get the bailout checks and to def and kick the can down the road and uh, keep tweeting about stuff instead of taking the medicine, right? If we don't take the medicine, our kids are going to gonna have to do a heart bypass, not just a simple uh, take take the medication, right? So, so I'm just very frustrated that uh, you know no one has a backbone here, not the politicians not the Fed, not Treasury. No one wants to take the medicine, right? Everybody wants to just kick it down the road. And, and that's just not America. That is not how this country was built. Uh, the grit, the, the, the innovation, the recycling, right? The ability to come out uh, of the, the cloudest day and, and, and keep walking. So, so the, what's not happening in this financial system is happening 10 times over in crypto. So crypto was born because of 2008, right? If you don't believe me, go look at the first block on Bitcoin. It says that right <laughs> there. <a> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you, yeah, it's, you don't, it's not about what I say, right? Satoshi has it right there in the, in, in the record. And, and we know that the innovation uh, in crypto is a thousand times faster and better than it is on, on Wall Street or on Main Street. So, so what's happening is, is that now crypto is pricing what the real market is. What's like, like Celsius is pricing the real value of dollars. It says to lend dollars, you can earn 8.8%. And the Fed is saying, no, 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 no. It's 0.1%, right? So who's right and who's wrong, right? That's really what the question is. I love you said getting high on their own supply. Every, every rap fan in the world who knows Biggie says, never get high on your own supply, right? So um, <laughs> it's, uh, everybody knows that you don't get high on your own supply. So yeah, I'm, I'm interested then, you said that you've entered into mining as one of your, as one of your main focuses. What, what uh, prompted that move 
Um, because obviously now was a perfect time to have done that with uh, the Chinese ban and the difficulty adjustment and obviously all of that available hash rate. How far ahead of that were you and what made you decide mining was a place that Celsius wanted to be? Yeah, so we started investing last year, uh, way ahead of the news. And uh, we're already mining uh, over 100 Bitcoin every week. So we're, we're not a small miner. We're probably the largest one in North America right now. We're also doing it all with either renewable resources or uh, with uh, basically a full credit offset. So it's credit neutral or, bit, or carbon neutral. Carbon neutral. Mm -hmm. Right, carbon neutral. Uh, and uh, the, the issue is that, that for us, the, the, uh, we have over 115,000 Bitcoins from, from a million customers. Uh, I pay 6.2%, do the math. I have to generate uh, six, 7,000 Bitcoins just to break even with my community, right? So, so I, yes, I can get some from institutions. I can get some interest from exchanges, DeFi, like all the stuff we talked about. Why not bid, build a Bitcoin factory and get at least some of that from a Bitcoin factory? So unlike most of our, most of the people who are in the in mining business, we're taking dollars, investing dollars because they want to create Bitcoin and then convert it into dollars. Celsius is in the mining business to invest Bitcoin and get that big Bitcoin because our customers don't care about dollars. All of our right. customers are saying, I'm giving you my Bitcoin. I'm a hodler. I'm, I'm not selling it. I want to wait for a long period of time. I just want yield. Can you generate more Bitcoin on my Bitcoin and show me that you can do it in a safe and continuous and sustainable way? Right. So I saw your interview with Michael Saylor. Again, great job. He's a hodler. We are hodler. We think exactly the same way, right? There's no difference between the answers. I can repeat every one of his answers <laughs> and it will apply to Celsius exactly the same way that it applies to MicroStrategy. So then how would, since you were already in the mining business and are one of the largest in North America, what was your reaction when obviously all of the energy FUD started, the Elon Musk, the forming of the mining council, all those things, how did those affect you as such a large miner? Yeah, so you know what they say. First, they ignore you. Then they laugh at you. Uh, then they try to kill you. No, just kidding. But but the point is, is that we're, we're at that phase. We're at the phase where the banks and the financial institutions are realizing, look, they're seeing billions of dollars leaving their institutions every day, and they're all going in one direction, right? So, so they tried uh, to say that Bitcoin is uh, not safe. They tried to say that... Uh, uh, you know, whatever, right? Now they're basically saying it's not green, right? So the next thing they're going to say, the Fed chair doesn't approve of it, or I don't know what. But the point is, is that uh, uh, FUD will always be there. And, and the funny thing is that uh, if you buy a Tesla, your Tesla is less green than a Bitcoin because your Tesla feeds, you think that your Tesla is 100% electric, but it takes power off the grid and the grid is less than 50% uh, uh, renewable, right? Something like, uh, you know, 40, at, in the best states, it's like 40, 45%. Uh, at the same time, I think Michael Saylor uh, told you that in North America, it's over 67% renewable. Uh, so again, your Bitcoin is greener than your Tesla. And the irony is that everybody talks about electricity. <laughs> They're electric cars, <laughs> like they run exactly. on electricity. So what matters is where the energy comes from, not the electricity that it's using. Exactly. Right? And that, yeah. So it's completely false narrative when you consider it in that manner. Exactly, and, and look, if we want more renewable energy, there is nothing better to create more renewable energy than new demand because none of the new dollars, there is no investor in the world that I know that is willing to put money into coal or natural gas. They all wanna put money into renewable energy. So you create new demand, we create more renewable energy. So Bitcoin is contributing to this new demand. It's all, it's a hundred percent new demand. When China shuts down and gigawatts of power are now being demanded by crypto, that is all new demand, right? That is giving investors incentives to put more wind, more solar, more hydro, and so on, so on in, in all the different areas, but obviously also in North America. So, so the opportunity is there. We're seeing many, many countries jump on it and say, please do it here. Uh, in my country, please come over here. And I don't see any reason not to uh, bring some of that uh, mining capacity to North America. I think it's helps secure the Bitcoin network. 
it's a new industry it creates jobs it it it, it strengthens the grid because, because the electric grid because you need to build infrastructure additional infrastructure to move all that electricity around and the beauty of mining is that you can put the equipment very very close to the source of the power you cannot you're not going to take your tesla and drive it 100 miles to charge it close to where the wind is you're going to consume that power in new york city or in atlanta or or in uh, in wherever you live where the power is based, basically is moved hundreds of miles from from where it actually was originated and about 10 percent of it is lost because it has to be moved over those high capacity lines I was planning to drive my Tesla up the side of an El Salvadorian volcano to get my power, but uh, I couldn't get straight to the source, right? Yes. Um, so it's interesting. You talk about, obviously, the nonstop FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt, right? And it's the same recycled stories every single time. Yes, this time the China situation was much more real, but I think that we would argue that everything that's happening in China is good for Bitcoin and good for the Bitcoin network. Nobody wanted Bitcoin centralized in China, right? So. I'm curious, though, it's all fear, uncertainty and doubt. At what point with all of this talk of regulation, the Fed chairman talking about it, at what point do we have an actual story of something that's a threat to Bitcoin or crypto as opposed to a narrative? So first, I think every day, more and more major institutions uh, tip over to the Bitcoin side. Uh, like you've saw City and, and 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 Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley, every almost every major institution, Fidelity just announced they're doubling their team on 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 the desk on the Bitcoin desk. So every one of those that tips over is eliminating one more name that supports this uh, false narrative, right? right? So so very soon you're just not going to have anybody left. We we're all going to laugh when we hear the last guy there say, "Oh, you know, it might be the Fed chair." Who might still be talking bad things about crypto but i think that group is actually shrinking very very quickly so the more assets are piling up on the bitcoin side the faster all that narrative is going to disappear now there is definitely still uh, uh issues with regulation there's uncertainty about regulation there's a lot of money parked on the sidelines waiting for clarity and i think uh, i have a i have a theory there i don't know if i'm right or wrong but the, my theory is is that you have now seven or eight billionaires who have applied for ETFs, right? The Winklevoss <laughs> twins, Mike Novogratz, and the uh, Ark, uh, uh, you know, Kathy Kathy Wood. Yep. Kathy Wood, you name it, right? I mean, there's like a long, long list of very, very rich people who are knocking on the doors in Washington and saying, why is this thing being delayed? And, and when the Fed chairman or somebody else says, oh, it's because of uh, market manipulation, they no longer accept that answer they're basically saying go fix the problem so when you see when you see four or five countries announce hey binance is not operating in our country what binance does is illegal in our country that is all derivative of that conversation in washington where basically people are saying we want that etf which is going to be huge i mean the price of bitcoin is going to go up 50 percent in two days the second an etf is announced so so you know we are getting closer and closer and closer. The fact that there's so much pressure on people like Binance, not, not Binance US, but I'm talking about the Binance offshore, the one that gives you 100 to 1 leverage, which is what they're really trying to eliminate. Uh, when all of that is cleaned up, uh, you know an ETF is going to hit and a lot more money is going to come in. And then the SEC and everybody else is going to be defending the consumer instead of hurting the consumer right now they're basically all those people are saying hey it's not a good asset don't put your money there it's not safe right that's kind of the irony is if they approved an etf right now bitcoin would be much safer for the community for the consumer and the price will be much more stable so yeah. it, it, it's kind of like a jumbo shrimp it's an oxymoron right so <laughs> so so i think but but i think we're very very close right so i think we're months away from it and hence my uh, uh, kind of positive prediction on, on the pricing of this market. I think a lot of good news are gonna happen. And you know Bitcoin, right? I mean, most of Bitcoin appreciation happens in a few days. You miss those few days and you will never catch Bitcoin at those prices uh, again. So, uh, so don't try to time the market, average in, decide what your exposure is. Like you said before, you need an allocation. Uh, don't put in what you cannot afford to lose and then basically buy a little bit every week 
and, and make sure that you average in. And sometimes you'll buy it at the top of the market and sometimes you'll look like a genius because you bought it right where Bitcoin bottomed and you'll be like, gosh, why didn't I buy five times as much? You know, well, because none of us really you, know. You never you know? bought enough and you never sold enough, depending on the time when the market market hits. And That's nobody, right. and, and nobody. It's not, this, this is not financial advice. I'm just telling no. you how I feel about it. And same. obviously I, I each person, yeah, each person has to do what they're uh, comfortable with. And, and um, you know, do not ever take, don't do leverage trades. Do not take margin you can't afford. Don't borrow money and do the stuff. This is an asset allocation. 10, 20% of your assets is probably the maximum you should be exposed to any of Yeah, these. I was going to say, what about people who are 90, 95, 100% in crypto? Because it's very common. Some of them are on margin, right? Some of them are 3x, 5x margin. A lot of these people who did this GBTC trade were four to one leverage, right? So, so the reason we have a lot of this uh, unwinding, because we, we already flushed, I think, all the retail guys because just Binance liquidated like a million and a half accounts. <laughs> so crazy. And, and you saw in the future and now the markets, uh, you saw uh, a huge shrinking of the book. So I think we're at the end of that. Uh, we just have probably one more flush to go on the GBTC side, right? We need to get through that. And we need this negative narrative to kind of run out of steam. And uh, maybe Elon needs to say one or two nice things about Bitcoin. No, just kidding. You know, he's, he's a tourist. We can do it without him. So, well, he tweets about Doge now. Nothing happens. That's right. And, Even the Doge and, people say, yeah, "Hey, nothing, Elon, right?" But on. nothing happens. I mean, he tweeted about Doge three or four times in one day, and price didn't move. I'm sure he couldn't sleep at night because he was like, "Gosh, <laughs> what happened to my superpowers?" You know, all my superpowers are gone. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's really true, but it's it's good to see. I mean, it's good to see because that's one of those narratives that needs to die. Yes. You know, I, I think. So what do you think that the end game is then? You brought up Binance, obviously, and we've seen it's just like regulator after regulator, hit after hit. Nobody's prosecuting. It doesn't seem like it's just everybody's sort of saying what you're doing here is not compliant with our laws. We're going to stop. And we're seeing their payment processors pulling out and all this. Do you think that ends in some sort of litigation? Or do you think it just ends, as CZ said, sort of in more clarity and they continue to operate. He, he likened it to the automobile. He said, listen, when automobiles were invented, people drove around the roads, they started having accidents. So they started making laws to prevent those accidents. And then they realized that they weren't wearing seatbelts. They made laws with seatbelts. Do you think it's like that, that they were just early or do you think that the hammer's gonna drop? Well, when, 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 uh, when you give people a hundred to one leverage, that's giving them a car and taking away the wheel and saying, <laughs> okay, go ahead, drive the car. Right, so you you almost like want them to get into an accident because then you get to keep all their coins. So, look, CZ proved that he can do uh, run an exchange in a regulated way. Binance.us right. is a fully uh, compliant, regulated uh, platform. So when you when you can deliver a fully regulated one and you continue to do all that monkey business, uh, then uh, who can, you can't blame anybody else. You know exactly what you need to do. And the faster we get rid of all these offshore uh, uh, platforms that are not compliant, the faster we're going to get an ETF, the faster we're going to get mass adoption, the faster Bitcoin is going to go to the moon, right? All those things are tied together. So in a way, we, the community, the crypto community, are holding ourselves backwards by not cleaning our own act and by enabling or supporting or empowering uh, uh, this type of behavior. The gamblers are going to gamble, right? I mean, you talk about the community and a huge part of the community are people who want heavy leverage to gamble on Bitcoin price. And, and that's why we have regulations and people are, are normally are restricted from doing things or, right? I mean, uh, we have a society that has rules exactly for those reasons, right? Yeah, unless you're in Vegas. Your, your, bar, <laughs> your bar kicks you out and tells you last drink yeah, because they have responsibility, right? They, 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 they can't just say, sorry, you know, I gave the guy a bottle. I'm not responsible that he, he crashed and killed three people. No, you are responsible. Yeah, you have to take the keys away. So I did you talk about the crypto community. You guys just came up with a concept called proof of community, correct? Can you talk a bit more about what that is? I think it's a pretty significant move. Yeah, so again, all of this stems back to the same kind of things that Satoshi was uh, uh, stressing, right? That 
Lehman Brothers uh, went bankrupt, I think it was June or July of 2018. Uh, three months earlier, their auditor proudly stated that Lehman Brothers is, is a huge, sustainable and profitable uh, ent entity. They had 50 to one leverage, meaning if they lost 2% of their value, they were out of business, obviously, and the markets moved more than 2%, boom, they couldn't open business Monday morning. Uh, so that leverage, uh, tremendous leverage doesn't exist in crypto. You cannot create that kind of leverage on the blockchain. Yes, you can create it in centralized exchanges, but you cannot go and borrow two Bitcoins on the blockchain where only bit one Bitcoin exists. So what Celsius has done is really set a new level, um, uh, a, a new level of transparency, a new level of accountability that we hope everybody else in crypto is going to do. We're doing this as an open source project, meaning we want others to join and basically create the standard and hold each other to a much higher standard than what the banking system or the financial system does today. And by doing that, we are effectively guaranteeing that our community benefits, right? Because you're already getting the highest yield, you're already getting the vast majority of the yield being created. And now you can see through into these institutions and make sure that they are fully transparent and they're acting in your best interest. I think a lot of people think that if you're DeFi, you automatically are uh, good and you're transparent and everything is good, but we're seeing uh, hacks and rug pulls and just pure theft uh, happening almost every day. And it's very, very difficult for people, even professionals, very, very difficult for them to know which project is a good project and which project is going to steal 100% of your money. And we've seen uh, Mark Cuban and others fall into the trap uh, because it's very, very hard to know what's real and what's not real. So Celsius, just on our security team, right? And we now have over uh, 400 people. Just our security team is larger than most companies have in employees, right? Most of these DeFi projects have an employees. And we do, we go into the extreme details of verifying every detail before we put even $1 uh, on that DeFi allocation. So uh, we've looked at over 100 platforms. We've approved less than 10. And uh, again, we have never, we have not had a loss or a hack uh, like most other people. So, so if you're using uh, our platforms, you actually are probably safer than if you did all this work yourself, even if you have a PhD in computer science, because uh, you just, again, these things change every day, right? The projects update their code they issue releases, batches, patches, and all that stuff creates doors there through which money can be lost. So, so I think the world, if you look at 7.8 billion people who are all vying for yield, uh, they, most of them, 99% of them are gonna look for a CeFi platform because they don't, they're not gonna learn all the details of DeFi. They're not gonna figure out what farming is. And even if they did all that, they'll be stuck on Ethereum running two or three uh, projects where Celsius does hundreds of these things and provides you on average a higher yield than what you can earn yourself. Do you think that platforms like yours can replace banks? So it will replace the yield portion and the loan portion of banks. I think banks still perform a lot of other functions for businesses, for, for the community and so on and so on. And so we're not planning, we're not trying to replace banks. Uh, we're trying to get people to unbank themselves because Banks, again, are not your friends. They don't act in your best interest. What banks do better than anybody else is extract fees and make money on your money and then deliver all of that every quarter to the investor, to the shareholders of the bank, right? We just had all the banks uh, report their quarterly numbers just a few days ago. All the banks reported all-time record profit. What do you think that means? That means they took all that money from you because it's all yield and fees that they charged you and they delivered all of that as dividends or as bonuses to their employees and their shareholders. With so less so than 1% yield, with no, nothing, like zero, nothing. Zero, yeah. zero, the average in, the, average in the United States is 0.1% because even when they published 0.5%, half of all deposits don't earn anything. So you got to, you got to, you got to, Right, JP Morgan announced that more than half of their deposits don't pay any interest because people are lazy. They don't move it to their, from the checking to the savings or money sitting while it's being moved, right? They keep your money for three days when they, you issue a wire transfer. 
all of these games that end up being you not earning any yield, right? And the real value of dollars, take a dollar, convert it into USDC, put it on Celsius 8.8% all day long. Yeah, I, I mean, it really is astounding. Will you be able to do that Even forever? Coinbase. Or do you think that goes down? Even Coinbase, Coinbase now is four percent. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Even Coinbase said, "Okay, we can't see all this money going to Celsius. We'll pay four. We'll pay half of what Celsius pays." So, so uh, uh, they could have paid you before Celsius existed, but they decided not to. Yeah, uh, absolutely true. But it's clear that even the slow movers like Coinbase now are moving into yield. That that's going to be the standard. Whether it's 1% or 10%, you will earn something that will be better than your bank on almost every right. platform. We, we forced their hand. I can assure you if Celsius did not exist, most of these players would not pay you anything, right? Uh, sure. All these people that call themselves Robin Hood, again, they're not your friends and they're definitely not taking money from the rich and giving it to the poor. They're taking money from one rich guy and giving it to another rich guy. Especially the platform that's actually called Robin Hood. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Right. Uh, they, make, they make hundreds of millions of dollars on order flow, on rehypothecation, on sec lending, and none of that, not one dollar, finds its way to their customers. Uh, and, and that's what's so sad is that all of those users, millions of users, don't understand that they created the 20 or 30 billion dollars that Robinhood is worth. Now they're going public. And they're not going to benefit from any of that. They're not going to get one dime of the value created or the revenues that were created inside the company, leveraging the assets contributed by these users. So if CFI is going to replace the lending and yield side of banks, what are banks going to do to stop that from happening? Because they certainly don't want that to happen. Well, look, it reminds me, I, I went through all of this uh, with the phone business, right? So when, when I uh, came to the United States and uh, AT&T was the uh, uh, most profitable company in the world and 90% of its profit came from international settlements where they charged $3 a minute to call Japan or UK or Israel or whatever. And I said, no, that's going to be replaced with free internet voice over IP, what we're using right now. Uh, no one's going to pay anybody anything. And today... Uh, at t makes zero, makes nothing. They actually lose money on international calls because they can't uh, charge anything for it. Uh, so the same thing is going to happen with banks. Banks are going to have to find a new business. at t luckily found the wireless business and they charge you $100 a month, whatever, to for your 5G phone. Banks are going to have to uh, be reintroduced to their customers and do something for their customers. Instead of taking money away from their customers, actually do something for their customers. So that's, that's my prediction. And uh, again, we are unbanking uh, people every day. Uh, most of our customers, we have a 90 something percent retention rate. As you know, our assets grew more than 10 X in, in, in one year. And uh, it's not because we're so great. It's because banks are taking their customers for granted. If banks paid 8% to their customers, no one would use Celsius. Uh, right. And interestingly, they theoretically could, right? I mean, they, all, all it is is about splitting. I mean, you guys, are you still 80-20? Is that correct? 85-15? I know you're somewhere in that ballpark for your split to customers. Yeah, so, so JP Morgan reports their return on capital. They actually tell you every quarter how much money did they make and they can pay their customers 8.8% and still be profitable. That's the, the amazing thing is because their return capital is 16, 17%. They just don't want to, right? They, they know that they don't have to, right? Well, so if you don't have to, and you've been doing this for a hundred years, why would you change your behavior? So just like Coinbase had to fork up 4% for GBTC, for GBTC, for USDC, uh, the banks are gonna start uh, low, increasing their rates. They're gonna have to, because uh, the, uh, as, the, as more and more money bleeds into CFI and DeFi, uh, they're just not going to have money to operate. And if they don't have money to operate, they're going to have to shut down, sell all, all those fancy buildings downtown, just like the phone company did, you know? Yeah. So, so it's it deja vu like, all over it. Like Yogi Berra says, it's deja vu all over, all over again. again. So you, then you have to feel like we're exceptionally early. We are. We're still in the first few innings. Again, most people 
not just don't know what Bitcoin is, they don't even know, like if, even if you told them and they believed you, they wouldn't know what to do. Like they wouldn't know how to create an account, how to move their money, uh, how to, uh, what is a private key, what is a public key and so on. So it's on us, about 1% of the population is probably knows what this is worldwide. It's on us to basically uh, uh, go out there. Well, that's what you do every day, right? I mean, I right. give you a lot of credit for, for not, every day there's a video explaining uh, something with a uh, with new face and somebody you're interviewing or explaining the news and so on. And, uh, you know, that's, uh, they're, they're, now there are, again, thousands of uh, YouTubers and influencers. I mean, we have great ambassadors like Michael Saylor and just Jack Dorsey and others who are, uh, you know, we used to have, uh, what's the name? We used to have uh, uh, McAfee, right? Uh, and those were our heroes. So, right. so I think we upgraded uh, uh, <laughs> all across the board uh, and we have an opportunity to really uh, reach the masses. Uh, uh, and, 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 you know, some of them are going to be tourists like Elon, right? I mean, some of them are just here to find uh, 10 million or 100 million followers. That's all they care about. Uh, but some people like Michael Saylor, I give him a lot of credit for not just investing, going all in on Bitcoin, but then spending tremendous amount of time educating other people and, and, and sharing his conviction in the asset class and in, in why this is uh, really uh, the best assets out there. Interesting. We've seen, obviously, institutions like his start to say, buy Bitcoin, hedge against inflation. Um, when do we see institutions just say, go buy a bunch of USDC and park it on Celsius and earn my 8.8% and call it a day? So we already partnered with amazing companies like uh, Line Japan, uh, 600 million customers. Uh, you earn interest in Japan, that is Celsius paying you that interest, right? They, they also have a US subsidiary that uh, does the same thing. We partnered with uh, Liquid, which is an exchange, tier one exchange. Uh, we partnered with many, many others, Voyager, many others uh, to provide this yield. And so we're not just offering it directly to consumers. We also have an API, full API and right. uh, more, probably two dozen uh, partners that, through which we kind of getting, like Voyager offers you your stocks and your crypto in one account, right? Celsius doesn't do that. So it's for people who need that. A, uh, it's, you know, Voyager is a better option than Celsius. So, so we, we, we're not trying to do everything. We're trying to focus on having the highest yield and then uh, 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 add additional services like proof of community, like uh, the lowest cost loans, right? Everything we do uh, is a zero to one uh, engagement, like Peter Thiel says, right? We invent the category and then everybody else tries to copy it. But, but right. uh, that, that innovation is what drives people uh, across from traditional finance into uh, uh, DeFi and CeFi. Is there an AUM cap where all of a sudden you have too much money and you just wouldn't know where to put it to earn yield? So I, I remember doing interviews uh, two years ago and so on, and we had like, I don't know, 200 million in assets. And people said, well, when you reach 500 million, when you reach a billion, when you reach 5 billion, well, we reached 22 billion before this crash, we had 22 billion in assets. And so we don't see any uh, slowdown. We can go to 40 to 50 billion without changing any of our strategies. Wow. And like I said, we have several hundred strategies. So it's not like one or two or five. And uh, uh, 10xing from there, yes, we're going to need to create some new ideas. We already have uh, uh, you know, uh, a variety of, of ideas we're working on. And the entire industry has to grow. Like DeFi has to be several hundred billion for us to be able right. to deploy a few billion in it, right? So we cannot be 60% uh, of, of DeFi. And that will be way, way too much risk for our community. So. So that's why mining is a big business for us. That's why institutional adoption is so important. We're spending a lot of time on that. And again, we have global customers, right? I mean, we have 350 institutions all over the world. Uh, we've done loans, single loans, as big as $100 million, right? You're not going to find wow. anyone else who can tell you that they can do same day, $100 million loans uh, with institutions. So so when when uh, you know when when you need a large transaction, uh, Celsius is your best counterparty these days. So I know we're up against it here with uh, time. I'm curious, 
what can we look? Well, clearly you just said, I mean, the entire industry has to scale for you to be able to scale to that level. Obviously it's sort of a chicken and an egg, but that's most likely to happen. But what can we look forward to from platforms like yours in the coming year, five years, 10 years? You know, what are the big plans that you have before we go? Sure. So we're adding a credit card that effectively has, it's not a predatory card. It's not going to charge you 24% and charge you fees, right? So in the same spirit of not charging any fees, this will be the best card you've ever had. And it leverages the fact that you have assets with Celsius to really give you a low cost borrowing or, or you can spend on credit at a very low cost compared to what your uh, bank is giving you today. Uh, so, so that's definitely a very important offering for a lot of people. That is how they want to transact. And we also are going to be expanding our mining business. We're going to be partnering with uh, top 20 blockchains. So, so we already announced uh, Polygon. We announced uh, Cardano. We announced, uh, we just, Today we announced, uh, we launched our ZK rollups with Horizon. So that's the Zen uh, coin. Um, so we have probably a dozen partnerships with major blockchains in which, again, we're innovating and creating new services that were not available before. And unlike these islands that are created right now in the community, for example, FTX Solana or Binance Smart Chain and all of their uh, pancake swap and all the stuff they're doing over there versus Ethereum versus Bitcoin. Celsius is really building bridges all day long. All we do is build bridges into traditional finance and then build bridges across different blockchains, right? So, so we're not trying to have our own blockchain. We're not trying to convince people to switch from Ethereum. The opposite. We want developers. We want the community. We want people from traditional finance to be able to do what they need to do across all blockchains. We already support 14 chains more than anybody else, right? There's, there isn't anyone else paying yield that supports 14 blockchains. So, and that's our commitment, right? Uh, like I said, over 400 people uh, and all of that is uh, money we're spending to create all this infrastructure so you can earn more yield, so you can borrow cheaper, so you don't need to use your bank. Perfect. So where can everybody follow you and check out Celsius after this? Sure. So I'm on Twitter at Mashinsky, my last name, M-A-S-H-I-N-S-K-Y. Uh, you can also follow, obviously, Celsius Network on YouTube, Twitter. Those are two, our two main uh, channels. We're on Medium as well. Plenty of uh, posts over there. And uh, I do a show every Friday. Uh, not like you. I do it only once a week. Uh, you're and a little busier. <laughs> Uh, but follow me, follow our uh, YouTube channel and, uh, and you can reach out to me, uh, CEO at Celsius.network and uh, love to talk to you and hear your ideas. If I was managing tens of billions, I think people would be upset if I was on YouTube and podcasts and Twitter all day, every day. So I think they'll understand that you even get to do it once a week. <laughs> well, I think it's important to, to get feedback from the community, to talk to uh, our customers, uh, when you listen to them, you build better products. Again, these products are, it's not about what the company thinks, it's about what the customer want. And when we hear the consistent message of, uh, well, for example, we're adding swaps uh, and the ability to buy and sell things inside the app that's launching next month. And so these are all things that came as a result of the community telling us what's important for them. Right. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for your time. Uh, glad we got to do this a second time. I'm putting you on the calendar now for like six months out for round three, if that's okay. That's right. We should compare notes at least every six months. Thanks, Scott. Absolutely. And, uh, thank you so much. Yep. Dope.